blessed day to you, our distinguished viewers. We are rather thrilled to have you with us on another exciting episode of Women on the Watch, powered by the Shapers Act. I am Wonola Adetayo, the Shaper. At Women on the Watch, we remain committed to exposing proven and time-tested principles that help us in our personal development and in our relationship matters. It has happened that over the years, as we have gotten into troubled times, our systems have been plagued by what you might call a cycle of unhappiness. Yet, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 12 reminds us not to dread what scares the world. Indeed, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 7 invites us to eat our food with joy, to drink our wine with a happy heart when God has accepted our works. Unfortunately, it turns out that many of us, when we are plagued by issues and challenges, the promises of God tend to diminish and we magnify our problems, throwing ourselves into the cycle of unhappiness. Last episode, we discussed this issue of happiness and we tried to look at how we can work and make sure that we're constantly in a state of happiness. In today's episode in particular, we will be looking at the happiness recipe because we want each and every one of us to stay happy. Our Bible reading will be taken from Genesis chapter 30 and verse 13. Genesis 30, verse 13. And Leah said, happy am I, for the daughters will call me blessed. And she called his name Asher. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we thank you. For the blessed privilege to learn at your feet, we say thank you. Lord, we ask, O oh God, that you open our hearts, open our eyes, and open our ears to understand what your heartbeat is concerning each and every one of us staying in a state of happiness so that your name will be truly glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Our case study is the story of Leah according to Genesis chapters 29 and 30. Once upon a time, in the land of Haran, there lived a man named Jacob. He was the son of Isaac and the grandson of Abraham, the great patriarch of the Hebrew people. Jacob's journey led him to his uncle Laban's house, where he hoped to find a wife and build a family of his own. As Jacob arrived in Haran, he was captivated by the beauty of Laban's youngest daughter, Rachel. Love bloomed within him, and he made a heartfelt proposal to Laban, offering to work for seven years in exchange for Rachel's hand in marriage. Laban, sensing an opportunity, agreed to the deal. Seven years passed swiftly for Jacob, filled with anticipation and dreams of a future with Rachel. Finally, the long-awaited day of the wedding arrived, but under the cover of darkness, Laban, seizing an opportunity to secure his eldest daughter's future, orchestrated a deceitful plan. As Jacob exchanged vows and consummated the marriage, he was unaware of the treachery unfolding in the shadows. When morning broke, the sun revealed not Rachel, but Leah, standing before Jacob as his newly wedded wife. Shock and disbelief washed over Jacob as he realized the extent of Laban's trickery. Furious and betrayed, Jacob confronted Laban, demanding an explanation for this unexpected turn of events. Laban explained that it was customary in their land to marry off the elder daughter before the younger. Laban offered an immediate solution. If Jacob agreed to work for him for an additional seven years, 
he would grant him Rachel's hand in marriage as well. Though wounded and bitter, Jacob saw no other choice. He loved Rachel deeply and could not bear the thought of losing her. Determined to fulfill his heart's desire, he consented to Laban's proposition, thus embarking on another seven years of labor. Leah, meanwhile, found herself caught in the middle of this complex web of deceit and unrequited love. She was aware that Jacob's heart belonged to Rachel and her heart ached with longing for Jacob's affection. Apart from lacking in beauty, Leah had to carry the weight of feeling unloved and unwanted. But Leah possessed a resilient spirit. She refused to allow despair to consume her. Leah believed that if she bore Jacob's sons, he would notice her. Her love would finally be reciprocated. So, with each child she conceived, Leah saw a glimmer of hope, a chance to win Jacob's heart. The firstborn son, Reuben, arrived, followed by Simeon, Levi, and Judah. With each birth, Leah offered up a prayer that Jacob would come to see her, truly see her, and love her as she loved him. Yet, despite her efforts, Jacob's affection remained firmly fixed on Rachel, who, through no fault of her own, was unable to bear children. God, witnessing Leah's plight and her unwavering devotion, blessed her with more children. Issachar and Zebulun were born, and Leah found solace in her growing family. Meanwhile, Rachel, consumed by the ache of infertility, encouraged Jacob to father children through her maidservant, Bilhah. Through Bilhah, Jacob had two sons, Dan and Naphtali. But Rachel's yearning for motherhood persisted. God opened her womb eventually. She conceived and gave birth to a son named Joseph. The joy that filled Rachel's heart was bittersweet for Leah. While Rachel celebrated the arrival of her beloved child, Leah continued to bear children for Jacob, Gad, and Asher. Two more sons graced their family along with a daughter named Dana. Throughout their tumultuous journey, Leah's steadfast faith and devotion did not go unnoticed by God. God saw the depth of her love, her resilience in the face of adversity. And in a poignant moment, as Leah brought her fourth son into the world, she named him Judah meaning praise. In this act, she expressed her gratitude to God, acknowledging his blessings, even if her husband could not fully reciprocate her love. Our prayer for everyone and every family that is enduring unhappiness for one reason or another is that God will cause you to arise and praise his name, for you shall triumph over your ugly situations in the mighty name of Jesus. It has been said that the only thing that is constant is change. Yet, most people naturally resist change instead of preparing for it and profiting from it. The Indomitable by Wanawola Adataio offers a time-tested framework that will help you ride the waves of change in today's world that is characterized by volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. With scriptural evidence and research-backed facts, the book will equip you with the mental infrastructure that will help you overcome primordial instincts and respond from a place of power every time you are confronted with the realities of our constantly changing world. Give yourself an unfair advantage by imbibing sound wisdom that will help you stay ahead of the curve. Send a WhatsApp message or call 0812-402-0538 to order your copies today. Welcome back. Leah's story offers us valuable lessons, teaching us that our happiness is independent of external circumstances, particularly if we refuse to allow it. Some lessons that we can learn from Leah about happiness. Lesson number one, true happiness comes from God, not from human validation. Leah's longing for Jacob's love and approval is a Relatable experience, many of us do that. Unfortunately, her story reminds us that ultimate happiness does not solely rely on human acceptance. 
Psalm 144, verse 15, David tells us, happy are the people whose God is Lord. Lesson number two. Lesson number two, we discover that contentment brings happiness. You see, for Rachel, I mean for Leah, despite being unloved by Jacob, she learned to find contentment and joy in her relationship with God. Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 and, and 12 tells us, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Leah's story echoes this, showing us the importance of finding happiness in God's love for us, in his provisions for us, even when we're going through tough circumstances. Lesson number three that we can learn from Leah about happiness. Comparison tends to seal our happiness. You see, when Leah constantly compared herself with her sister, Rachel, she continued to have pain. She continued to have unhappiness until she learned to curb the impulse of comparison. That's why the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. What other lessons can we learn from Leah about happiness? Lesson number four is that gratitude is a powerful catalyst for happiness. Leah eventually understood and she became grateful for her identity in God and she began to express gratitude to God because of his graciousness toward her. Genesis 30 verse 13 and Leah said, happy am I for the daughters will call me blessed and she called his name Asha. So she stopped focusing on what she didn't have. She started looking and being grateful for what she had. You see in the previous episode of happiness recipe, we explored the causes of unhappiness. And there are five causes of unhappiness. Number one, negative emotions. Number two, lack of fulfillment. Number three, poor relationships. Number four, unrealistic ex expectations. And of course, number five, other external factors. Now, today, we will be considering, you know, based on something that Martin Seligman, Martin Seligman, he said something that you call the happiness formula. And in that happiness formula, which we also looked at in the last episode, he told us that there were three factors. The genetic factor, which he said represents 50% of our ability to be happy. Second, the circumstantial factors that make up the situation. And he says that it represents 40% of our happiness. The most interesting is that our internal state of mind is just the remaining 10%. Now, this formula is based on how happiness works. Today, we are going to be looking at what we call the happiness recipe in today's episode. The reason is, for you and for me, it is in our best interest to take responsibility for our happiness, just like Leah had to learn to do. Why? Because happiness is under our voluntary control. So God has prepared you and I. He has enabled us to be in perpetual happiness, irrespective of the circumstances and situations that we face. And my prayer is that at the end of today's episode, you will have discovered that you have greater power and better choices over your happiness than you think or imagine. Now, the happiness formula. It is called what you might call, I'm going to be looking at the formula. EH means enduring happiness. What is the formula? Four factors. Number one, your God connection, GC. Number two, good thoughts, GT. Number three, positive attitudes, PA. Number four, righteous actions, RA. So the formula is, if you take a look at the formula, it is EH equals GC plus GT plus PA plus RA. We're going to look at each of these four factors. The first factor, your God connection. You see, the Bible says in Psalms 144 verse 15, happy is that people 
that is in such a case, say, yay, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. So our connection with God is very crucial because it guarantees help in time of need, according to Psalms 146 and verse 5. The God of Jacob, he is our help. So we have our hope in him. Second, happiness comes from the worship and the word of God. That's why we said God connection, very crucial. Second Chronicles chapter 9 and verse 7. Happy are thy men and happy are thy servants. which stand continually before thee. You see? So also correction in times of error. It makes us happy when God is able to correct us in times of error. So when you put all of these three together, our connection with God is a crucial factor in our happiness recipe. We go to the second factor, and the second factor is what we call GT, good thoughts. Proverbs chapter 23 verse 7 tells us, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. So we must examine what are the nature of, I mean, what is the nature of your thoughts? You know, are your thoughts encouraging? Are your thoughts uplifting? Or are your thoughts condemning? Are they positive? Are they negative? So in order to be happy, think kindly about yourself. Acts chapter 26 verse 2 says, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself. So take responsibility, think happy thoughts. Also, think good thoughts. Philippians chapter 4, verse 18. Say, finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are lovely, think on these things. What else do we do with good thoughts? Renew your thoughts by filling your thoughts daily by the word that transforms, according to Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. So factor number two, good thoughts. We go to factor number three, positive attitudes. That's the PA. You know, Positive attitude is about our response to circumstances. Remember Leah, when she continually, you know, felt bad about the fact that her sister was loved. It was negative for her. But immediately she changed her response and became more positive about her circumstances. Things changed. Psalm 42, verse 5. Psalm 42, verse 5. When, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. So please, just like Leah, make sure that circumstances don't dictate your happiness, but rather respond positively. You see, it is instrumental to position us for happiness. Genesis chapter 29, verse 31. Genesis 29, verse 31. And when the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. So, so God is even happy with us when our Attitude and response to situation is positive. We go to factor number four, righteous actions. Righteous actions. Romans chapter 14 verse 22 tells us, happy is he who has no reason to condemn himself for what he approves. So we must be righteous in the things that we do if we want to be happy. How? Number one, obedience to God's injunctions. John chapter 13 verse 17. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Number two, in righteous actions, avoid contravening the laws of God and the laws of the land. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. That is Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18. Thirdly, pursue wisdom and understanding. We see this in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 13. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom. And of course, you can add more by engaging in charitable activities, according to Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 21. He that despited his neighbor sinned, but he that has met mercy on the poor, happy is he. Okay, so today, before we conclude our discussion, I want us to remember the happiness recipe or what we have called the happiness formula. Remember, 50% is your genetic capacity for happiness. 10% is attributable to external circumstances and 40% is due to factors under your voluntary control. May I tell you that 100% of your happiness can be under your control as a child of God. Why? Three reasons. Number one, 
your genetics is determined by God. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Second, uh, you, uh, you know, the, 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 the circumstances surrounding you are guaranteed to be in your favor. According to Romans chapter 8, verse 23, all things will work together for the good of them that love God and those are called according to his purpose. Lastly, you see, that ability, that 40% that of the formula, the Bible tells us, Jesus said unto him, if thou can believe, all things are possible to them that believe it. So God can empower you. Therefore, as a cherished child of God, I urge you, embrace that incredible power and authority that God has bestowed on you. Step into the world with confidence and let the boundless wellsprings of happiness within you prevail. Don't allow it to be taken by external circumstances. However, please remember, your happiness is not dependent on circumstances. It, it is only God that can give you that power. So if you have not given your life to Jesus, today is one of the best days for you to connect with him so that he can be the reservoir through which your happiness continues to flow eternally. So if you are ready to give your life to Christ, please bow your head with me and say these prayers and say, Lord Jesus, I come before your throne. I ask, O oh God, for mercy. Please have mercy upon me. Forgive me all of my sins, and I repent of them. I ask, O oh God, that you write my name in the book of life. And I promise, O oh God, that I will live the rest of my life in obedience to your direction. Thank you, Father, for coming into my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. If you have just given your life to Jesus, please Connect with us through email to thewatchwithwono at gmail.com. And I want to welcome you to the family of God. We also want to welcome partners, sponsors, mentors, and prayer partners that will support our teaming callers. If you are interested, please send a WhatsApp message to plus 234-812-402-0538. Meanwhile, I look forward to welcoming you next week on another episode of Women on the Watch, powered by the Shapers Act. For now, I urge you to enter into the reservoir of your power to be happy as a child of God. Shalom.